Greetings. So I was looking at this paper by Dr. Jeffrey Mark Paul titled Why DNA Research Studies of Rabbinical Lineages and Their Importance to Jewish Genealogy. And I'll share a link to the paper in the video description. Any source I mention here, check the video description. You'll find relevant links and stuff there. And uh, I, I think this is a fascinating piece as it covers efforts to genetically test the presumed patrilineal descendants of prominent rabbinic figures and multiple descendants for each figure, apparently. And uh, this was done as part of an attempt to determine the haplogroups of those relevant figures. And so I'd like to jump straight to table six of the paper, which has the conclusions which were reached regarding the different haplogroups for those different figures. And I just wanted to offer some brief comments here on, on what can be seen and then maybe close it out with a, a thought that I extrapolate from that. And uh, one thing which you're likely to notice fairly quickly is that the haplogroups are all over the map as is the case with mainstream Jewish lineages in general, right? Like, so this is just, this isn't just limited to prominent rabbis and stuff like that, or prominent lineages. And honestly, it, it's almost always the case with population groups that number in the millions. They're going to be patrilineally diverse. And uh, right away, it's worth noting that a number of the lines are for subclades, which are downstream of JP58, which itself falls under J1. And this isn't a surprise as... While all haplogroups amongst mainstream Jewish populations are only held by a minority of that spectrum, uh, which is to say there's no majority haplogroup amongst them, the carriers of J1 nonetheless make up the largest minority, right? And you might also notice that of the lines which are currently highlighted on your screen, the top line and the bottom line don't refer to specific individuals per se, unless you put it back to Aaron. Rather, they are more vaguely described as Kohen lineages, or one of, the, the, one of them's a subset within the Kohen lineages. And as was touched on in my video on the Y-DNA of Kohen claimants, somewhere north of 45% of Kohen claimants have haplogroup uh, JP58 or a subclade thereof. So again, not a major surprise that Kohen lineages are amongst the prominent uh, J1 carriers, or more specifically, carriers of JP58. And however, that aside, where this does get more interesting is the haplogroup assigned to the Baal Shem Tov, uh, which is the founder of the Hasidic movement, as while he has a J haplogroup as well, it's a subclade of J2. A number of Hasidim have trafficked in the belief, or perhaps we should say the tradition, that the Baal Shem Tov was from the House of David, which is to say that he was a patrilineal descendant of King David. And with that in mind, I must confess, if this haplogroup assignment is accurate, I would consider it highly unlikely that the Baal Shem Tov descends patrilineally from King David or anyone else in Abraham's uh, patriline. Now, and I, I just want to be clear, I don't mean that disrespectfully, uh, but I don't think there's a good case for J2 being a Abraham's haplogroup, and therefore I don't think there's a good case for J2 carriers uh, descending patrilineally from Abraham or any of his descendants. But moving on from that to other haplogroups, which are perhaps you know, which can perhaps be described as unlikely to have been possessed by Abraham or his descendants, two of the lines have subclades of G2. The top line of the two which are now highlighted is assigned to Levi Yitzhak of Berdachev, who is, in my opinion, a rather interesting character. He wrote a very interesting book, which is now known as the Kedushat Levi, and uh, I might make a video about him and that book in the future. Uh, but for now, it's worth noting that his haplogroup is apparently a subclade of G2b. And uh, as for the bottom of the two lines which are highlighted, a uh, quick technical note, there's a typo in the paper. Uh, the relevant subclade is... FGC 1107, not FCG 1107, but whatever the case, that falls under G2A. And in conjunction with those two lines, I want to also note that another line has a subclade of R1A. And the reason why I wanted to note these G2 and R1A lineages together is because I would think that these are candidates for possible patrilineal descendants of Khazars. Now, as a disclaimer, I'm not claiming that Ashkenazim who have these haplogroups necessarily descend from Khazars, but it is nonetheless the case that among the haplogroups found amongst the Khazar cadavers were G, R1A, and Q. So the minority of Ashkenazim who have either G, R1A, or Q are, to my thinking, the most likely candidates for patrilineal descendants of Khazars. Now, again, as a disclaimer, I let me actually let me offer a clarification. Personally, I reject the idea that Ashkenazim are simply Khazars. You know, that's something that comes up in polemics. And I also reject the idea that all or even most Ashkenazim descend patrilineally from Khazars. However, 
I also reject the other extreme, which is, you know, denials of the Khazar conversion and, uh, you know, as well as denials that there are any descendants of Khazars, or, you know, or, or Khazar converts today. Me personally, I, I would strike a middle path between those two extremes, taking it for granted that the Khazar conversion did happen and, and also taking it for granted that a minority amongst mainstream Jews today descend patrilineally from those converts, from the Khazar converts from, let's say, 1200 years ago or so. Right? But of course, these haplogroups, which are highlighted on the screen, also existed outside of the Khazar population. And it's even arguable that some Jewish carriers of those haplogroups may descend from persons who converted long before the Khazars, as you can also find those haplogroups amongst West Asian cadavers, which are dated to centuries prior to the Khazar conversion. Hence why I said that having these haplogroups does not necessarily, you know, it doesn't necessitate that one descends from a Khazar, but if there are Ashkenazim today who are patrilineal descendants of Khazar, Ours, they would likely be amongst the G and Q and R1A carrying minorities within the diverse Ashkenazi spectrum. And uh, interestingly, one line was assigned to RV88. Now, this is separate from the whole Khazar thing. Uh, now, ad admittedly, RV88 has been in Europe for thousands of years, but it also might have been in West Africa for millennia as well. Now, I, I don't think anyone seriously entertains the idea of RV88 being the biblical Jacob's haplogroup, but it is nonetheless interesting to think of a haplogroup which is shared by both some European Jews and some West Africans, and a haplogroup which apparently was in West Africa long before the transatlantic slave trade, with the West African RV88 characters being part of a back migration from Asia. And, and I worded it like that to, to sort of show, to provide an example of how, you know, sometimes a certain thing can tick off some interesting boxes without being remotely close to actually unveiling a patrilineal descendant of Jacob, right? However, moving on from that, if we're going to speak about potential patrilineal descendants of Jacob, this is where I personally would turn to the carriers of E1B1B. Now, I realize that there are others, including folks far more well-versed in genetics than a peripheral observer like myself, and, you know, these are folks who would argue strongly for J1 being Jacob's haplogroup. And, and that's fine, right? I'm more than willing to acknowledge that there's a legitimate possibility uh, for J1, especially on a local flood model. But nonetheless, I personally lean towards E1B1B as the most probable candidate. And I've mentioned that in previous videos. And, you know, we can discuss this subsequently if anyone's interested. However... Of course, I am not claiming that if a person has a subclade of E1B1B, they necessarily descend from Jacob or even Abraham, but it is my personal opinion that these are the best candidates for such. And uh, of the three E1B1B carrying lines that are highlighted on your screen, the bottom one has more specifically a clade of EM34, which some geneticists have proposed may have its origin in the Levant. Now, if that's accurate, it would mean that carriers of EM34 aren't merely related to populations which resided in the Levant. Rather, they would all be direct patrilineal descendants of a man who lived in the ancient Levant. But I digress. Uh, however, before I end this short video, I, I wanted to share a closing thought regarding the diversity of haplogroups that you see on your screen. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, right at the beginning of the video, the, the diversity of patrilineal, you know, the diversity of paternal lineages, uh, which we see in prominent rabbinic lineages, that diversity is also reflected in the larger Jewish population. And I would propose that the genetic evidence shows that this diversity is very old. When it comes to a swirl of E1B1B, J1, J2, and haplogroup T, which wasn't reflected in the chart on your screen, and to a lesser extent even R, that diversity is found across what might be called the culturally Semitic spectrum. So that's to say that swirl of haplogroups, you know, again, E1B1B, J1, J2, T, and to a lesser extent R, that swirl is not only found amongst Jews and Arabs, but so too linguistically Semitic Ethiopians, and the genetic evidence seems to imply that this diversity goes back millennia. This diversity of haplogroups has been in the region amongst linguistically Semitic groups and culturally Semitic groups in the region, and you know, in Northeast Africa and, and Southwest Asia for thousands of years. But narrowing our scope to the Jewish world, I would propose that they were not quite aware of this diversity until genetic testing brought it out. Moreover, it's not a recent development. That's what I was trying to, the, a point that I really want to drive home because, you know, on the contrary, as I just noted, this diversity of haplogroups goes back thousands of years. And I think this raises a question about how confident we can be about Jewish lineage claims. 
not just with Jews, of course, you know, in just about any population group, I think it's fair to have a healthy skepticism for lineage claims which span across millennia, right? However, I've found that some feel that Jews are a bit more unique amongst all populations, you know, a bit more unique in terms of preserving their genealogies. Or some might feel that if, let's say, secular Jews have lost the sense of their lineages, at least ultra-Orthodox Jews have still maintained their genealogies, so their lineage claims can be trusted. Uh, and um, to be fair, I've certainly met Hasidim who confidently pass on claims that they've heard about the lineages of their rebbies. And, uh, you know, some might even say that if, you know, even if ultra-Orthodox claims in modernity are shaky, surely those in the Middle Ages kept good records of their genealogies. And others might say that even if those in the Middle Ages were unsure, surely those in antiquity, like those at the dawn of the Common Era, knew their lineages with great accuracy and confidence. And whichever of those positions you would take, I would disagree across the board. I would think that just as a person today does not know their lineage going back 4,000 years, so too a man living in the first century would be unlikely to know their lineage going back 2,000 years, at least not with any certainty. You know, and they might feel confident about the claims that they've inherited from their immediate family, but I don't think there would be strong grounds for us to share that confidence. As I said, the Jewish people and the region in general have been diverse for a very, very long time. Food for thought. But with that, I'll close this video here. As always, I welcome any comments, questions, or criticisms. So feel free to share your thoughts, whether positive or negative. And God bless. Uh-oh! He said he don't think Josephus knew his own lineage. Who who do y'all think? Who do y'all think? Hera, what about Hera? You think Hera knew his lineage? Or maybe this is where the confusion. No, this is going to be beef.